Awesome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Hopefully you caught Tom. Uh, we just had a great conversation about the javelin, and, and now we're here with Dane Miller, um, who's going to uh, we're going to pivot just a little bit away from the javelin and, and talk what he's got going on in training and, and some of the other throws. And um, once again, we've got to thank MF for, for hosting this and, and being a big part of, of getting this all together. Um, and, and thank you to the National Throws Coach Association for helping us get the word out on this. I know if it was uh, just me, we'd have maybe three or four people watching this. So uh, thank you, Rob, and thank you to those two organizations. Um, today, our, our second speaker here is, is Dane Miller. Um, Dane has his hands in a lot of pots, and I'm kind of excited to hear about how he handles it on all. He is the owner of a, a, a private facility, Garage Strength. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Dane, but owner of a um, company called Earth Fed, Fed Muscle that does some, some high-quality supplements, uh, co-owner of Throws University who does video analysis in the throws, um, he's written several books. He's got a family. And on top of all that, he is coaching elite athletes in both the throws. You have five or six elites that you're working with right now that are ranging from, uh, you know, U.S. champions, African champion, world champion, quali ship qualifiers and Olympians, and working as a USA weightlifting um, team coach and, and coaches an elite group there. So you know, several sports, several uh, businesses and we're excited to hear kind of your thoughts on the throws and thoughts on training and, and thanks for joining us Dane. Thanks for having me. Thanks for MF and perform better. Thank you and and thanks Rob, Rob for having me. Yeah I mean we'd love to I hear add I want to add a little brag though. <laughs> I've had I've had four sports in a, at a world championship so that's uh, freestyle wrestling, sprint cycling, uh, Olympic weightlifting and track and field. So I just wanted to brag a little. You're four ahead of me there, so. <laughs> but I've got a nice sweatshirt, so, you know. I was going to comment on that, actually. I do. I, I like it. It looks good. I, I've got an earth-fed muscle one somewhere. Kicking oh, good, good. I, uh, it's cold in my apartment, so. <laughs> um, you know, we'd love to hear just a little bit about you and, and kind of like your background, you know, what you did for sports and, and how you got into coaching. Um, yeah, I, I was a I was a shot putter. Um, I mean, honestly, in Pennsylvania, uh, to give you a little bit longer backstory, I, I grew up wrestling, and I, I was a football player, um, and I, I swam growing up, but I, I wrestled, I played football, and then around my sophomore year of high school, my you know I I decided to stop playing baseball. I wanted to go out for track, and um, I ended up breaking my arm my junior year of wrestling. I was like gung ho wrestling. That's all I wanted to do. And, and, uh, I broke my arm and then I, I did really well that year. I didn't, I lost my whole wrestling season. I did really well on track and then I, I did really well. And then I ended up winning the state title in Pennsylvania as a shot putter. And I threw it, I ended up going to Penn state to throw. Um, so my background's like wrestling football and, and uh, and track and field and, um, I went to Penn State, and and honestly, I think what what got me into to coaching the most is I I was always interested in sports performance and and training and 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 theory and stuff like that. And you know, my dad uh, growing up was a avid lifter, um, so I was always pretty interested in it. And uh, he, you know, my what he. My, my Christmas gift for my sophomore year of high school was a pair of bumper plates, right? So it was like, he was always very supportive and, and always like really positive and, and like just motivational, you know, he was never uh, overbearing or, you know, sort of like the crazy, I mean, he's a crazy dad, but he wasn't like a, a crazy obnoxious dad that would, that would sort of get upset if I didn't do well. Right. And I, and I think what, what for me was that when I was at Penn State, I, I dude, I had a serious drinking problem. Um, I, you know, I, I threw seventeen forty six as a freshman. I, I qualified for NCAA's as a sophomore, and then everything else just nosedive right into a bottle. Right, and it was like I, I felt like that um, that experience. The last three years of college, I was just depressed and pathetic, and and just not in a good place mentally. Um, I sort of wanted to salvage my career, and 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 what ended up happening was uh, back when the ring was still around, uh, Anatoly Bunderchuk had a group in in Kamloops, and 
you know, Dylan Armstrong and Martin Bingus here had posted about having a training group and I was going to go to Temple. I was, I was a religious studies major. I was going to go to Temple to get, to get my graduate degree in religious studies. And I was like, you know what, I'm either going to go try and be a professor in religious studies or I want to, I want to go to train under Dr. B and, and that would be like my graduate degree. And I would eventually try and open up a gym or be a coach or whatever. And, and I, you know, I'll be honest, I can't speak or, or read Hebrew or Greek. So my choice was essentially I had to go train with Dr. B and, and it was that, that's really what sparked me and being around him and how open he was to sharing information and, and helping me one as a thrower who was not at Dylan's level, but also, um, you know, just helping me uh, to learn the the science around coaching and all that, not just the actual uh, methodology, but also how to like coordinate with athletes and how to get into their head and, and stuff like that. So that's sort of sparked what I wanted to do. And then when I came home, that's when I opened up Garage Strength and then it, it sort of just took off from there. And that was 2008, the fall of 2008, 2009. And, and you know, you've... <laughs> You open, you open up garage strength in, you know, from a background in track and field, you found yourself coaching, you know, at an elite level, elite level, not just in one sport, but now um, two. And now you said you've, you've coached, you know, athletes in, in four different sports to a world championship level. How did that kind of, kind of come to be? And, and what are some of the things that kind of led you down that path and, and that diversity? I think for me, you know, a lot of the stuff I learned from Dr. B was like always, always question everything you're doing and always try to learn from your athletes. So I would, I would bring in these books to him all the time. And, and, you know, so, you know, I'm 24, 20, yeah, 23, 24 at the time. And I'd show him all these books and uh, you know, he would, he took Mel Sif and Berkashansky's book and he, 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 I handed it to him like, hey, what do you think? And he took it. He's like, this I dislike he ripped me off and in chapter four he shows me about how he he didn't cite him properly and all this and he's like you don't need you don't need these and and you know and, and he's like you've got to you know in English in uh, broken English right you've got to learn from your athletes you always have to learn from your athletes and so I I you know obviously I still read books and I and I want to learn the best methods that are out there and constantly get better but the biggest thing that he said to me that stuck with me was always learn from your athletes they're your best they're your best you know tool of education and I think that early on you know I started in a 400 square foot garage and then we turned it into a 900 square feet and then we bought a barn and we we were in a barn and then we added on to the barn and then we went from the barn to where we're at now, where we have a 10,000 square foot facility. And we had never taken out a loan or anything. Everything was just based off going back into the business and um, which might've been a bad idea looking back, looking back on it. But um, it was always just for me as a coach, I wanted to, to test my athletes and see what would work the best. And, and I was also fortunate enough that, uh, you know, Rob knows this going to, to Shippensburg for the PA state meets, but if, if you're in Pennsylvania, and you win a state title, like you're sort of like you put up on that pedestal, especially in local small towns. And that's basically where I'm from. It's like I was put up, you know, people knew who I was and I, I was an all state football player. So that also helped. Um, and my my dad was is a, was popular in the wrestling community and, and people knew who I was from wrestling, too. And so uh, I got a lot of really good wrestlers early on. And, and one of my first wrestling clients is essentially how I got hooked into the freestyle wrestling world, which is where I've had, you know, Nick Wisdowski has medaled at world championships twice. Um, and that's, it's just been this, it, it, you know, constant learning. And, and, and that's one thing, even with my best athletes, uh, you know, I've learned from, from sixth, seventh grade, eighth graders. And I've learned from, you know, Sam Mattis, who's a world finalist, you know, and, and I think that, open I, I'm trying to be open-minded I try to constantly be progressive and I also like to pick other coaches brains and really um you know really get a get into what they're thinking and what their thought process is and then and then always like having my puzzle my piece of the puzzle and where I could pick and choose and like where it would go into my puzzle right so I think a, I think knowing that everybody has different systems and everybody's system works to a point and then where do those other people's systems if I hear something how can I piece that in and I think that's something I'm 
I'm pretty good with that aspect of coaching. So I think that, I think that's sort of how it, it developed from, you know, from the time we did open up until where we're at right now. Very cool. And just from a, this is a selfish question, maybe an impersonal aside, but you have your three businesses, you've got elite, tra you got travel to meets all over the place, both weightlifting and track and field. Um, you've got a family, like how the heck do you manage your time? Um, you know, I find myself just as a, as a college assistant coach, you know, right. being it busier than I can handle sometimes. And, uh, you know, how, how do you, what are the keys to balancing your time and making all that? Yes, work? right here. So I have like, uh, I put in, I put, this is, this is my planner and it's just like every single day I have in, you know, what are my big three wins for today? What am I going to do? And then I have the, my week laid out and I, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious. This saves my life. It's, it's called the, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I don't sell this for the guy. It's called the full focus planner, but that's what I use. And then I, we also have a project management tool uh, called Asana. And that has saved me with our, with our business. Um, and, and to be fair, like I don't work at earth fed muscle anymore when, when we were developing it, you know, early on, like the first five years up until last year, I was working, I was working like 80 plus hours a week. And then my co-owner and I were 50, 50. We were just like, Hey, I, I, I told him, I, I don't want to work in earth fed muscle anymore. My, my passion is coaching. My, I want to be the best throws coach I could possibly be. I want to be the best weightlifting coach I can be, the best strength coach I can be. And that's where, that's where I, I, I love it, right? Like, I, I, I love it. So that helped getting out of the, out of the, the work aspect of EFM. And, and, but, dude, having this planner, I, I write everything down. And at the end of the day, I, I literally will just sit here and I, I write down what I need to do. And then, and then, you know, for that, for tomorrow and what my goals are going to be for tomorrow. And then we have this project management tool. So it helps me manage the seven employees and, and, it, and it's just the same as coaching, right? It's like, if I can, if, you know, when I think about coaching and I think about managing employees, it's, it's like customer service. If I can do it all, like, Every question that an athlete has, I want to have that answered before I give them that program, you know, so that way they're less annoying to me and I can deal with them a little bit better. And I think that that's, I think that's helped me. I, it's not something I've been good at, right? Like I've, dude, I've been a disaster with, with uh, time management and, and I've been a disaster with organization. And I've been, if you saw, if you saw, you know, when we first, started earth fed muscle i didn't even have a, a google drive account i didn't have you know with garage strength i used to put my my programs on the wall in in notes and i would write notes and assign it to people and then it's just like you know I, when i started garage strength i didn't even own a cell phone so i think like uh which is pathetic in 2008 but but i i think that's you know I've tried to, I try to progress and, and I try to keep up with it. And, and for me, the best thing is going home to see my kids and jumping on the trampoline and spending time with my wife and my four kids. So it's like the better I've been uh, at coaching and organizing my time and the, in, in the, uh, the more I value my time and the more I construct organization with my time, the more I get to spend with them as well. And that's where, that's what I care about. So I, I prioritize it. Whereas before I didn't have kids, I didn't prioritize my time management. I think that that's, that's what held me back for a while from a business perspective, you know, and I think that that's, that has made me a better coach too. I, I will say too, I do have urgency. Like I have a, if I have an idea, I'm like, I gotta do this. I gotta go do this right away. Right. So I'm very urgent with stuff which can be a detriment, but as far as planning is concerned, if it's, if I, if I have something I want to do, I'm going to do it because of that urgency. And I don't know if that's like a, my dad's a little like that. My brother and my sister are like that. You know, my mom's a little more laid back, but, but we're the three kids, my brother, my sister and I, we're all pretty urgent. And, and uh, I think that helps too, you know? Nice. I, uh, one of our, our, uh, our tennis coach has a, has a saying that I, I, I've been trying to live by a little bit better. 
Ohio, she says it's an acronym she puts up called Ohio. It's only handle it once. Like once, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. once you open something, just like finish it. And so right. That's how you, that's how you live. <laughs> I try to, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I try, I try my best. Yeah. And, um, so how did you, like you develop garage strength, you're coaching some wrestlers, um, and you know, you got your general pop clients. How did you decide to kind of develop that into like Olympic lifting and having a throws club and having your general, you know, general pop clients as well? Yeah. So the, the Olympic weightlifting parts a little, it's a little interesting is that, um, I was full blown throws wrestling and, and football training and, um, and, and so, you know, we did the Olympic lifts, so we would snatch, we would clean, uh, we would do jerks, but do them separately, uh, high bar back squats, all this stuff. Right. But I had never, I had never done anything. And with the sport of Olympic weightlifting now for me, I had at the time that we got into it, I had snatched a little over 300 pounds, but on, on a rusty bar that didn't spin, I didn't use a hook grip. I, I jerked, you know, over 400 or whatever, but nothing, I was never trained in it. And I actually think that's partially what helped me sort of rise pretty quickly in weightlifting. And we had a shot putter who was, you know, he's a sophomore throwing like 50 feet, but he was really little. Um, and his name was Tanner Reichert. And, and he was, you know, cleaning like 300 pounds, snatching 230 as a sophomore in high school. And uh, I had posted a video of me snatching and then a guy randomly was like, you got to get him into a meet. He might be able to make the, the junior world team. Um, and, and I had never done a meet. I, I had no idea of what it was. Like I knew what it was, but I had never coached. So the, I always tell this, I, I love this story is that 2012, the, the day, the first meet I coached was 2012, the day of the opening ceremonies in London. And, and, and by 2016, I was coaching Norik Vardanian at the Olympic trials, but I, I think in, in weightlifting. And I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, just again, going back to throwing, going back to what I learned from Dr. B and, and learning, you know, from your athletes, but really it came back to the uh, power development, mobility, strength, acceleration and, and stability. And, and that's what we use to train the athletes. And so that, um, that's how we got into the, the weightlifting side. I forget the other part of your question. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that covered it. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious as a, as a track and field coach, I, you know, I don't compete in weightlifting, but I, I find it inter interesting and, and kind of do it as a hobby. Um, I'm curious, what have you, like your experience in weightlifting, how has that affected, you know, how you coach throws? In yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so the way I base my programming is sort of, I have, I have what's called that athlete reactive analysis. So I try to see, you know, if I have Sam or my, or, or Rachel's thrown 1850 or, or, you know, Alex throws, uh, the way I lay out their throws is I have them with specific implemented implements that are weighted like two fives, two, two fives, two Ks or, or for, for shop, but whatever, you know, various weights. Then I have a, a set scheme of, you know, snatch or snatch variation and then the clean or clean variation and then squats. And then, and then we, we prescribe this, this lift and we try to pair it with these implements and then we track how they're feeling um, throughout the program. And then that's how we set up their peak. Uh, and, and what's helped is that I can really see in weightlifting because weightlifting is, is um, it doesn't have as many moving pieces as throwing does. Mm -hmm. It's easier for me to gauge how an athlete responds to different uh, types of stimulus. So when I, when I try to characterize three athletes that I have, I sort of lump them into three different groups and then I know how each one's going to handle specific types of cues, specific types of intensity, heavy, light, whatever, competitive. And then I try to, I, I sort of use my weightlifting realm to run tests. And then I sort of bring that over to the throwing world uh, and, and use that on our high schoolers and our college and or post collegiates. And then that's, that's sort of how they're paired together. And I, and I know um, you know, how many, how long it might take for somebody like Sam to, to, to back off and, and to hit a peak or, or to not back off and, and sort of push it a little bit more depending on their type. So I think like 
the two together really helps me. And it also helps me. Um, the most important thing in throwing, I believe, it tends to be technique. And, I, and it's the same in weightlifting. They're very, very technical movements. And they're very technical sports. And so the mentality has to be, you know, throwers are such big, aggressive people. Um, but when you can switch a thrower from being like, like, like I was an idiot, right? Like just ah, like always just wanting to throw as hard as possible to having that technical mindset. Now they can get into a meet. And if something's not going right, they think logically instead of emotionally. And I think that's the biggest part with Olympic weightlifting is you, if you want to be a good weightlifter, you've got to be logical with your thought process. Yes. There's times that you've got to increase your, your intensity and your aggressiveness. Right. But, but the technique and, and the technical mindedness or technical literacy has to be, the, the most important aspect. And so when, when our goal and, and what we do here is, is like everything has to be to get the mindset of the athlete to be technically minded and then aggressive, not emotional first. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always got to be technical first. And I think that that's how that's helped me um, see movement better. And it's helped me as a coach being in weightlifting. Um, it's helped me to understand movement and, and to, to, to see how, you know, mobility issues can impact performance and, and stuff like that. But ultimately it comes back to that, that big mindset change, you know? Yeah, that's very cool. Um, and, and what are some of the biggest similarities and differences you see, you know, between, you know, the training or the type of person that's doing the Olympic lifting and throwing or, or the biggest similarities and differences you see between those two sports? I think it depends on the individual, really, those three athletes. Some of the – I'd say the, the throwers are always going to go after it a little bit more. Like weightlifters, they lift so much, so regularly. Like for, for, for the way I set up the throws, we, we lift five days a week, but it's really like the first two days of the week is the higher intensity, and then we sort of back off during the week. Um, with the weightlifters, though, it, it's, it's quite a bit more intense later in the week. and and the weightlifters are always just sort of going to follow what I want them to do. Whereas the throwers, you know, if I, if I'm downstairs with them and I go to the bathroom, I come back and there's like 20 extra kilos on the bar and I'm sitting there, what are you doing? Why are you going after this? So I think the biggest difference is that, and that's even with the women, like they're, they're much more aggressive um, to a fault really. Like, it, it, you know, the women and the men are, are just much more aggressive in throwing than they are in weightlifting. Um, and I, and I think that's, you know, that's just a sport too. It's, 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 uh, yeah. I, and, and, and our, we have a couple throwers to be fair that are like larger than life personalities. So they're, they like that, right. They feed off of that. They, they, they want to, they want to push me. Like I'll, I'll be upstairs in the office and, and if they're lifting and I'm not down there, it's like, Hey Dan, I just, you know, Sam yesterday, I just tripled 182. It's like, why did you have 182 on the bar? But 400 <laughs> pounds for a triple, you know, it's like, I think that that's, that's the biggest difference is that the, the throwers love to just go heavy all the time. And, and, and that's not the best really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have some throwers that would argue with you on that. So. Well, yeah, of course they would. <laughs> it's like that. It's like that all the time. Like yeah. Sam, why, or, or, or anybody down there, you know, why are we, why are you benching this heavy right now? We have sets of six. Why do you have why do you have eighty nine percent of your max on the bar? It's like, well, I'm a thrower. <laughs> and the hot, the bad part is, is that I'm just like, all right, just try it, just try it. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be mad at them, but you can't. Yeah, yeah. It's like I I just beat it even worse, you know. Uh, how do you how do you implement the Olympic lifts um, with your throwers? And yeah. is there a, a different technical level like standard that you're you're working towards or? Yeah, I mean, from a from a technical perspective, I'll be a little bit less uh, on them with their movement patterns, which I might, I should maybe be a little bit more um, hammering them with certain movements. But the big thing for us is 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 we almost always do what I call a no feet, so they don't they if if they if these are their feet right they they don't they won't they'll start in the catch position most of the time. And the reason why I like that is, is my technical model and the throw is similar. It's like a, it's like a grounded finish. We don't, we don't teach to jump as much on the finish. 
and that's just some, that's the model we use. Um, and so I like to use those same uh, feeling, uh, grounded finish feeling in the in the lifts. Um, you know, we use a lot of snatches. We use a lot of cleans. We use a lot of cleans off of boxes, though. So it's like a little bit, it's a little bit less of a toll on their on their back. Um, but we do, you know, we do a, quite a bit of behind the neck jerks and we do a, quite a bit of push presses. So the way we use them on a, on a leg day is like, we, we're going to use, um, a snatch or, or snatch variation. We're going to use a clean or clean variation. And then we're going to do some type of a squat, depending on what I'm trying to get out of that program, um, and that goal. Right. And, and on the, on the, the way we would use the Olympic lifts on the, on a upper body based day is it, it's basically used to potentiate the nervous system and to, and to wake up the nervous system. So it's, it's firing as aggressively as possible. Um, and so their body is prepared, um, you know, so it's desensitized, right? So it can handle a much higher load than it otherwise would have if we wouldn't do heavy jerks. And, and I'll, I'll use this, you know, the day Sam, hit his bench press PR. He also hit the right before that he hit his, his best behind the neck jerk at the same, in the same session. And I believe that that has a lot to do with the fact that his, his neural drive was potentiated so well, he was in good shape. And, and on top of that, like he, he was, his, his sensory receptors are desensitized from that, that heavy load on the behind the neck jerk, you know? So that's sort of how we use it. And then throughout the week, uh, we use it for mo. We use them for mobility movements. We'll do. We'll have days where we're just. Hey, we're doing seventy kilo snatches, and we're just doing. You know, we're just using it for mobility work to to work on the thoracic extension and to work on hip mobility and back mo lower back mobility and stability, so they hold better positions through the center of the circle. So we use it a whole bunch of different ways. We get creative with it. We do some some middle gr mid grip work and. I like to say we use it for speed, we use it for strength, we use it for mobility. And I think that being creative with those exercises, it makes it, you know, unique. And, it, and then I use it as that, like that governor on them for when we're trying to peak. Very cool. Um, and brings me to a different, like similar topic of, you know, you've had success getting athletes to a high level in various sports. And to me that like, that screams, this guy knows how to, periodize or organize training you know what i mean and, and can adapt that to that model to whatever you know sport the athlete or calendar the athletes working in so i'm curious you know how do you approach periodizing your training and organizing training and uh al Sheehan on youtube put in a question of, of talk, could you talk about periodization through like a theoretical three-month throwing season loaded question there <laughs> yeah through a three so so I'm going to do a little bit of branding here. Um, so I, I, it's, it's sort of tough. If in the realm of, of sports performance or of periodization, right, you've got sort of like Dr. B, the complex method, and then you've got um, a guy named Dietmar Schmidt-Bleicher, who was like the first, the guy who did a lot of the research on undulating periodization. And so what I've sort of done is in, 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 is it's almost like combine these it's it's like a form of undulating periodization and i call it parabolic periodization so what i try to do is that when my intensity is is high my volume will be low right and it sort of crosses back and forth but that would be like one almost parabola on our strength curve but then we sort of factor in the implements and that's where the implements sort of sort of um, create this relationship with what we're doing in the weight room. And that's dependent upon the athletes. Some athletes, they need high volume and they need a, a lot of throws and a heavy implement. And some of them need low volume and, and high, high throws. It just depends. Like there's those three types that I talked about earlier that I use. And, and, and the big key is just figuring out like, okay, does, does this athlete throw, you know, a heavy implement with a light implement? does that bump up their competitive shot or discus or is it better to have a competitive implement with a heavy or a competitive with a light and how do they react? And, and that's also based around what we're doing in the weight room. So out of a three month time frame, um, you know, with our high schoolers, what we almost always like to do is, is the weather is terrible in Pennsylvania up until like right now, early May. 
uh, even though it's still pretty terrible right now. But we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll try and push through like that first two weeks. Um, so like middle March to April, early April. And then we might take a, a step back like that first week of April a little bit. Um, and then our big test event basically is pen relays and that's at the end of April. So we might have like, we back off of them a little bit in the weight room for like a week, but then we want to push and we want to try and figure out by pen relays. All right. Are we going to peak them at States? Are we going to peak them with a heavy shot or discus? Or are we going to peak them with a light shot or light discus? Right. And then it's, and that's relative to their competitive implement. Um, and, and keep in mind, these high school kids, these are guys that are – these are women, men and women that are thrown with us like five or six days a week. They're, they're here pretty regularly. Um, and, you know, they, they, they're into it. They're, they're, full bought, they're fully bought into it. So, you know, that's how we, we set it up then is that by, by pen relays, we'll figure out what, what each athlete needs. Um, and then we go to we, – we'll, we'll build the next five weeks based off around that result, and then we'll go to the states and win a state title, right? And that's, that's, that's sort of how we factor it up. And so, you know, some of our athletes, um, you know, like uh, when we had a girl who set the state record in the shot through 51 feet, two days prior, she was just one of those people that she, she would, did really well when she would lift heavy the week of a meet. So on like Monday and Tuesday, we were lifting like, dude, she was, she was cleaning like a hundred kilos, right? 220. And then this four days later, she throws 51 feet. But then, you know, the next year we had a girl who's at William and Mary now, and she won the state title the next year. She didn't, she, if she lifted that heavy two weeks in a row, she, she would have died. So it's like figuring out, you know, how to, you know, Keely is very different of an athlete than how Peyton was. And then Maria, who we had this year through 5111 in high school, you know, she led the country and, and she's also different from those two. She's so wired. It's, it's unbelievable. So it's sort of like figuring out, look, like there's different athletes that are going to throw far for different reasons. And, and it's sort of like that first two months in a short season. Now we also have the whole year that we can base our, around our knowledge of how they're going to compete, but because they're with us so much, it, it's, it's just figuring out those puzzles and how people are going to, how people are going to, you know, perform as uh, to their, their, their highest ability, basically. I don't know if that answers this question though. No, I, I think so. I mean, um, so if I'm interpreting it correctly, like you're using like, you know, people respond different to different stimuli and, and you're using like that first third to half the season to really experiment and figure, and figure out, out what makes each individual click. Right. And kind of yeah. using and, and that. To, I like, think, Oh, go ahead. I, I think well, I think the key is too is that if if you want to be a good high school shot putter, a good high school discus thrower, you can't you can't train like once in a while. That's not gonna happen anymore, right? Like unless you're an absolute freak of nature. You've gotta be able to train um at least six months out of the year if you want to throw far. And I think that, that that as a coach, you if you're a high school coach you've got to stay in contact with them and what they're doing so that you can, you can also understand when they throw their best. You know, some kids will throw a 14 pound shot and then they drop down to the 12 and all of a sudden they're throwing five feet further. And some kids will throw a a 14 pound shot and drop down to 12 and they can't feel the 12 and they're throwing at the same distance. You know, so it's like you, you wouldn't peak that, that kid with a 14 because he can't feel it. And and that's just like, you've got to be aware. And that's where, you, you've got to be organized. You've got to take, take your, your, your data. You've got to track your information and you've got to know what you should be tracking. Some people are tracking the wrong stuff. So you've got to know what to track and you've got to know how to relate to the kid. Like some people in the middle of a meet, they're, they're giving them 17 cues and they're, and they're saying negative things to them. And it's like, dude, athletes don't respond well. I mean, older, older athletes might, but, um, young kids, they don't respond well to, to negative reinforcement in a, in a competition setting. They need, they need your support as a coach. And so that's the other thing I think we do well is like we try and figure out what cues they respond best to and we can see their body language. And that's part of where the Olympic weightlifting comes in is that when we're teaching them the movements, we can see how they handle different technical cues and, and then use that later on when, when we are peaking because it, it, 
that's as, that's just as important. How you relate to an athlete is just as important as the methods that you're going to use. Because if you have a, an athlete and they don't like you, they're not, they're not going to listen to you. They don't want to throw far, right? Like that's the, that's a big positive is that when your athlete enjoys you and, and enjoys being around you, now they're going to buy into that system a little bit more. Yeah. And you kind of set yourself up for another question. You said, you know, you got to track things and you got to know what to track. What are some of those pieces that you feel like are really important to track, um, you know, with, with your, your throwers to figure out how the respond can, they can, you know, you can get extract the best thing, best throw out of on Saturdays. Well, I, I think the, the best thing to track as a thrower is, is their, their throw, their competitive throw. Right. So we've got to see, you know, we have relationships um, between, I, I wish, I, I wish we were down in my front room. I have this whiteboard and, and, and Rachel fatherly, we know that if she throws this far with a 6K and this far with a 5K and this far with a 4K, and this far, with, it, it, it just comes down and, and you can see where it's going to be um, based off of those distances. But, but track, the, track those throws. I think one of the big errors, and I'm not saying that you have to track these throws every day, but one of the biggest errors is that we track weights in the weight room. You know, we write them into our training program, but we don't write in what cues are we giving this athlete today? what you know how far did they throw today based off these cues so we always know based off the snatch this is the weight we used but we don't know and we don't even think about it based off of my positive tech technical cue or negative or or indifferent but it's still an action this is how they responded those are the most important things so you have that'd be like a a, a good thing to track but but if you just said like, all right, well, that's a little in depth, right? The, the, the throw, the competitive throw, track their bench press and, and track their bench press for time. So we established like 225 for high school guys, um, 135 for high school girls, 315 for, for the elite um, uh, men. And then, and then we're going to track their, their power snacks. We're going to track their uh, cleans off of one box, power clean. Uh, there we we call it unbroken fast back squats um, and if and if those and then they're behind the neck jerk and if those are all lined up and then we then we can sit there and say like okay now we can back off if this person needs backing off from volume if this person doesn't need it we need to plan out you know okay when their bench hits this we need to get their bench to here their squat to here and their competitive throw to here well then, then they're going to be in shape so I think it's you know five or six things that you track um, but it, it doesn't need to be crazy, crazy hard. But you, you also have to track how, how you know, I, I believe technical cues in training, I believe that those cues are as important as the lifts that you're picking in the weight room. And that, that creates a response. Some, I was a thrower that if I heard a couple cues as a thrower from my, my coach, I would cringe and just get so mad, like, dude, that cue doesn't work. Stop using it. You know? And I think that having those open relationships with your coach and, and discussing this stuff leads to uh, a better performance and better result and a better relationship really. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit and get to a couple of these questions we have on YouTube. Um, had Rob, Rob Source is asking, um, I'll put him on the screen here. Oh, he's gone. Uh, how do you balance <laughs> athletes coming to you for help when they're also working with uh, a very the various high school pro coaches and programs? Yeah, that's that's some that's a good question because I that's something I've struggled with. Okay, like I early on when I opened the the gym, I had I had support locally, um, and I. I think the other thing is, is like when I, when I'm coaching, I'm so like, I'm in my, a bubble, right? Like I have no idea what's going on outside, outside of me. And people will all, like, I don't have a TV at my house. We don't watch movies. All I think about is coaching. And so when I first got into coaching, that's all I cared about. And, and I had good support. But then when, when we started to have, you know, regularly state champs and, 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 success I started to to notice like people were were just not they didn't like it they they 
you know, especially I think because at the time I was younger, I was like 28 or 29. I think that had a negative part of it. And I also handled it poorly. I never, I never like approached other coaches and was like, Hey, I want you to know your, your athlete reached out to me. All I care about is getting them to win a state title. I don't care about hurting. I don't, I don't want to step on your toes and hurt your feelings. I am only interested in getting this person to win a state title. If anybody walks through my door. The only thing I care about is, can I get them to win a state title? Can I get them to win an NCAA title? Can I get them to the Olympics? That's stuff. That's stuff. So now, you know, cycling back around, um, we try to, we try to talk to the high school coaches a bit more. And, and now as we've, been around a little bit longer now now the high school coaches are you guys still there yeah i'm still here okay sorry sorry now the the high school coaches are are tending to like uh engage with us a bit more and ask us uh for help now too so it was i didn't handle it well for a while i think i think as a coach now we should be reaching out at, at least letting them know like hey this is our goal we're not trying to step on your toes or anything. You know, they, they came to us. I mean, we, we've, we've struggled with a couple of our like best throwers that have, have done phenomenal stuff. And then later on the coach has been like, Hey, you know, early on, I, I, I didn't like that you guys were working with them, but now I see like it, it helps. And I think that that's the biggest thing is that I'm here. Yeah. I'm here to make money, but my number one goal is to help people have crazy experiences that they wouldn't get in normal life, right? You win a state title in Shippensburg, that is freaking cool. Dude, you're standing there, everybody's sitting there, they're, they're putting this medal on you, it's awesome. You're like, you're achieving something that very few people do, and that's what I care about. So it doesn't come down to some selfish, like, egotistical issue. I know I'm egotistical, but that's not, that's not the ego part. You know, I, I want these kids to, to realize that the work they put in pays off because then it, then it turns into success later on, you know? Yeah, exactly. And so to answer Rob's question, I think that that's um, something that I have struggled with. And I, I also think it's something I struggle with, with the collegiate kids when they come back, but I think I'm doing a better job of, of talking to some of the college coaches um, and, and, and letting them know what we're going to be, what we're, what it's more like, Hey, what do you, you know, I'll, I'll actually use Keely as an example. She's at William & Mary. I, I take videos of her, and I send it to Alex Heacock all the time, and he'll say, hey, that, that's the one I like too. And, and we might talk about it, like, hey, what do you think we should work on next? Because ultimately she's his athlete now. Yes, she's training here right now during the coronavirus, but he's the one paying for her to go to school, and, and, it's, and that's important. And, and also I might have an athlete in the future that wants to go to William & Mary, so I also need to – not be a jerk. <laughs> That's fair. And uh, I'm going to ask another question from YouTube. Um, this is someone asking, how many days a week should a 14-year-old thrower lift with weight? And what weight? Question mark. Uh, a 14-year-old would be in eighth or ninth grade. I People think I'm nuts, but I'd say like four or five days a week. <laughs> I think, I think, this is another thing for me is that I want people to take to take throwing as seriously as they take football. So if you had an eighth or ninth grade kid, dude, I coach the one. Of the, I I do the strength training for the one of the best high school football programs in PA. If those kids aren't there five days a week in the summer, and these are eighth grade kids, ninth grade kids, their coaches are like, are where were you, right? And it's like. If that's a thrower, it's like, ah, no, let him go. It's like, no, I want, I, I want throwing to be viewed in that regard. I want to, as coaches, we should be coaching the way the football guys are. Maybe not like how they beat them down and abuse them verbally and the <laughs> negative stuff, but the intensity wise. And so for a 14 year old kid, eighth or ninth grade, dude, you want to throw 60 feet? You got to train four or five days a week. You got to throw four or five days a week. And that's it. If you want to throw 60 feet or you want to throw 50 feet, 65 feet for a guy is, I think, equivalent to 50 feet for a girl. If you want to do those things, you got to train five days a week. Very cool. Um, yeah, uh, and, and Olivia Raya is, is asking, have you, 
have you observed stronger positive relationships between certain lifts and certain throws? For example, a clean and a 5K shot for a female thrower. Oh, that's a tough one. I, I think, it, again, I, I don't want to, I don't want to like, back out on that tough question, but I think it does go back to the person more so than the, the implement. Mm -hmm. um, dude, I will say though, every thrower, you know, this, this is weird is that I've seen a greater correlation in the bench press to the discus than I have to the shot. Um, and, and I don't know if I, I, I have a theory that when you're benching here, the, the relationship with your shoulder, even on like a, a, a normal grip, your pec is lengthened quite a bit here uh, with your ulna or humerus, sorry. And so like it's similar uh, relationship with where you are with the discus. Um, and I think that that force, it's so lengthened in your pec that it's similar to that same position in the discus here when you catch. So we go here, now we're out here. It's the same lengthening of the pec. I do think the bench has a little bit better carryover to the discus. Um, it, I mean, it still works for the shot, obviously. It's still effective for the shot. I think the behind the neck jerk for the men is very, very positive in both of those. Um, I, I, I think, I think anything that you know, we do a lot of when we're peaking, we do a lot of partial Olympic lifts, so like off of two boxes or off a of high hang, and I think that that stuff correlates over to, um, a higher, a higher rate, like a higher twitch force to use a sciencey term and that that does have a good carryover um but i think it's very it's very dependent upon the athlete i think nice um and one back one of my questions what are the biggest things um so, and if i'm asking too many like planning training questions shut me down but i geek i geek out on that stuff so what are the biggest things you think coaches and athletes overlook when they're planning their training um, whether it's the throws training, their strength training, whether right. other aspects. I think it's reps. I think they, they overlook the effectiveness of, of just – dude, the biggest thing I learned with Dr. B was, dude, you got to throw a lot, you know, and, and um, I always relate it to, um, you know, to, to going back to football or, or to wrestling. Like if you're wrestling, if you if – you, Wrestling is like you're going to do your drills, okay, but then you're always doing live drilling. You're going to do live speed or you're going to do like a live period that might just be like a, like a flow type wrestling. And, and I think throwing needs to be a little bit more like that where it's like we've got to get a lot of, we've got to get a lot of full reps in and we've got to get a lot of – and we've got to have a technical goal for these sessions – um, so throwing, you know, 20 to 25 full throws, but with a technical goal. And at some points as coaches also saying like five to 10 throws where you're just like hands off, like let them get into a, the groove too. So I think that that's something that we overlook and we like to break down the throw quite a bit. And sometimes that can have a negative impact on that global throw. Um, I think too, the fear, the fear of, technical movements like the Olympic lifts I think we we fear using them we fear doing them in a full range and I think we also fear doing them with high volume and I think that that's the stuff that um you know I, I use the quarantine training right now as an example with our high school athletes that have weights at home what are they going to do if all they have a barbell if all they have is a barbell and bumper plates or a barbell and metal weights, what do you think I'm going to have them do? I'm going to have them snatch. I'm going to have them clean. And I'm going to have them do floor bench or push press. And then they have to do front squats after they clean it. I'm not going to have them do single leg glute bridges. I might have them do that as like an accessory later on, but we're not doing that as like their main lift. We're not doing, uh, you know, exercises like that. We're, we're going to be doing big time movements because they have, you know, they don't have everything at their disposal. So they have minimal time to train down in their basement or in their shed, wherever they're at. So we're going to do the, the lifts that, that carry over and transfer the best. And they're, they're snatching, they're cleaning, they're doing full squats, and, and they're benching, they're doing push presses, and then they're doing rows and stuff. But it's, it's like I think there's a, there's a fear from a planning perspective. There's a worry all the time of, like, actually getting a lot of reps in, 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 in the Olympic lifts and in the in – the, in the throws too. And I think that we, 
we like to break down into little pieces and it does need to happen at times. I'm, I used to be super anti-drilling. I'm not that anti-drilling anymore, but I am still, I still see everything from that global movement really. Yeah. Very cool. And, um, could you run us through a typical week of, you know, some of your elites and what they're doing or even some of your college kids when they're training, like what a typical week of training looks like. You can yeah. whatever athlete or event that, that you, you want. Um, Sundays we're, we're going to go ham. Uh, that's like our day one. Um, you know, we're going to go very intense in the throws and Sundays is like our craziest lifting day. Um, and Sundays is like the day it, I sort of feel bad. People come here to train on Sundays and they come in and, and like it's packed with throwers. And it's also like the energy is just crazy. It's, it's like, and, and that's the other thing that we have that it's not just like the methods. It's, it's, it's the energy. It's, it's a culture here. And that's, that's what's cool. Right. And it's people learn how to train in that environment. So Sundays usually heavy throws, heavy uh, lifting, uh, mainly it's going to be uh, lower body Olympic lift, uh, squat base. And then sun or Mondays, it's going to be uh, more throws work depending on how they respond. Sometimes Mondays might be like a, 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 a very technical session where I'll just be like, yo, we're going 60 to 70% in the throws, but some people throw really well the day after they lift really heavy. And then the third day they suck. <laughs> so it depends. Um, like Sam, yesterday just was went off and then this today he smashes everything now tomorrow he's going to be trash so tomorrow will be all technique work right so it's like uh monday monday um heavy upper body we'll we'll do jerks benches um some accessory work to make sure their shoulders are healthy uh good mobility work um and then and then the day three would be tuesday or wednesday we're going to do uh we call that athlete day so we're just like mobility, a lot of mobility stuff, a lot of like proprioception stuff, a lot of um, plyometrics after they do their good warm up and they're they're uh, they're like starting to loosen up. It's a it's a much mo uh, lower intensity training session, and then we'll do um, another leg lift, and and that's typically going to be like seventy to eighty percent. Um, they might push it if they're feeling good, if they have a lot of caffeine, and then the and then that. Um, the last day of the week, we'll do a lot of like shoulder stability work and, um, some slower eccentric with, with speed movements, uh, on the bench or on the incline. Um, and then, you know, then they'll throw Friday, then they'll just, they'll just throw Friday. And sometimes they like to switch where they might be like, Hey, can we do the upper body day Friday so that they'll throw Thursday and then Friday they feel fresh. And I, and I might plan, if we had a season, sometimes I'll say like, we'll use that as like the test day. So I'll let them have caffeine Friday before we throw, if they have off the day before in the weight room. So it seems, this might be overgeneralizing, but it seems like you take advantage of the beginning of that week when they're fresh, yeah. hammer, and then it kind of just slows down as far as intensity of training. And then by, by Friday, they feel pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So like Friday they'll they'll feel good, and that's that can be when they they can come back up and 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 blow up. Now I've had you know some athletes that that do well um, with a little bit higher intensity in the middle of the week, but I I think for longevity it's it's better to sort of have two or three days that it's like very technically focused. Um, and the good thing is, is they take that just as serious as they do as the days that, I mean, for the most part, they take the technical days just as serious as they do um, the high intensity days, you know? Yeah. Um, and you mentioned like part of the effectiveness, not just being the X and O's, but the culture, like you have a good kind of a uh, presence on Instagram. So I've seen some of your, you know, the stuff and it seems like a really upbeat environment. What do you think are some of the most important steps you take as a coach to you know, to foster that and to kind of, you know, nudge it in the right direction. Obviously, you can't just revolutionize it overnight, but uh, what helps create that environment? I think just being positive and, and, and like, I can, it's funny to say that because they always say I'm always criticizing them and yelling at them, but 
I think it's, I think it's like, uh, it's like the golden rule, right? You know, if, if I treat them well and I'm clear about my expectations, if they know my expectations and they know what I want out of each program or each block, then they, then, then we're on the same page and they also know my goals. And, and, and this goes back to my personal life, right? Like, they know I have four kids and a, and a wife and I've got other businesses and they know how much I value throwing and they know how much I value the weightlifters and, and all that. They know this. So they know, and they know my dreams, right? I have, I have serious dreams. I have, I have like goals that I have personally as a coach that I want to accomplish. And that I want to do it with these guys. I want to do it with everybody in my gym. So they know, they know the, the implications of where they're at. And I think that they, I think that's part of it. But I also think it's, it's also as simple as, you know, I learned early on in, in college to try to relate to a lot of people. And I think that that's the other thing is that like, I, you know, I didn't come from a very affluent family. So I had friends that were very wealthy and friends that weren't. And I, and, and I think it's important for everybody to be open-minded and to accept people and, and, and to be open to what they're into. And I think that, you know, that's also partially like my religious studies background. Um, dude, I think it's as easy as like, Hey, guess what? Let your kids play music that they like, let them play. You know, they want to pay, play Kendrick Lamar, let them play it. Don't play your soft rock from the seventies. Like, sorry, they, they don't want to listen to that. And I think that that's, that's something my dad taught me because I, you know, when we were coming up, we would listen to rage against the machine and my dad, did, oh, you know, I want to listen to the stones and Led Zeppelin. And, and then what's funny is later on, that's all I want to listen to now. Right. But it's like that he let us play what we wanted to play. We were playing beastie boys and he's like, what is this music? But he didn't care. And I think that that's something that I sort of brought with me here is like, Dude, that's that's a really quick way to to relate to kids is to let them listen to the music they like, and that that creates their environment. You know, obviously there's got to be uh, a little bit of control over it if if you've got young kids in the gym. Um, but I think that's an easy trick that I do that, and I'm into their culture. The like I I try to know um, like modern music is one of the few things I'm actually good at knowing in pop culture, whereas not necessarily pop, but um, I think that that's an easy thing to do that makes it makes you more relatable to your athletes and it, and it keeps you in touch with them, you know, and, and ultimately just trying to, to, to understand who they are as, as people and what makes them tick. You know, I, I ask them all the time, why are you still throwing? Why are you even here? Why do you come here? You know, and, then, and they'll give me an answer. Like, dude, I want to throw 70 meters or I want to make the Olympic trials or I want to win the, the NCAA championship or I want to win a state title. Okay. Well, you know, that's good. That's what I want to know. And just asking kids why they're doing it. Cause I, cause honestly, I sit there as a, if, if you don't want to do that stuff, then don't train here. I don't need you to be here. Go somewhere else and, 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 and do whatever you'll be more positive somewhere else. I think that asking and being open about that, I, I like to talk too. So I think that's part of it is that, I just run my mouth a lot and they just listen. <laughs> uh, I got one more question on YouTube that we haven't caught up on. Um, and I've got one, you know, a couple more questions. I don't want to keep you all night. Um, but uh, David's asking, David Lane's asking, what type of throwing technique is best for high school shot putters? The glide question mark. Oh, that's, uh, that's a good one. I think, I think we did a blog on this on throws university, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, and, 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 and this is such a tough question for me because I'm, I'm a glider at heart. Like that's me is, is I'm a, I'm a glider at heart. And I, and I think we, we sort of, I, I, there's so many times that I've seen athletes that are poorly coached, try to switch to the spin and just lose basically lose their career because they're trying to switch the spin and they, they didn't get coached up properly. Um, but at the same time, there's enough resources out there now, you know, there, there's enough, there's enough content online. There's enough information. There's enough uh, books. You could go, you could buy any book from Rob and, and learn how to spin. Right. And, and, and that's the stuff that these guys need to do if they want to switch to the, to the spin. 
And so what I would say is, is if, if you want to, if you want to be a really good thrower, you need to spin because it's going to also help your discus, but you need to be a, a student of the sport. You know, if, if we think about like Tom Brady didn't become the best quarterback in the, in the, in the NFL by accident. He was in at 5 a.m. studying, and he would leave at 8 o'clock at night studying because he wasn't as talented physically. He made up for it here. And the best throwers in the world can make up for it mentally. And, and if you want to be a good thrower, then you better buy in to learning the sport and learning, you know, in, in, the, in the NFL or, or even wrestling. Like, you know, I, I know I'm making these comparisons quite a bit, but, but in football – uh, we have QBs in high school that can audible out of different situations based off of a cover cover scheme. Where they run cover two, they run cover cover three. What do they do? Where's their linebacker? Is the linebacker blitzing? Okay, well we'll do this. But in high school, we don't expect that same that same um, I guess uh, buy in to the sport and to understand what the sport involves. And I believe that that's that's part of coaching is like, we got to get these guys, you know, for, for him, I forget his name who asked the question, but he's, he's got it. Was it David? David. Yeah. David's got to sit there and say, look, if, if you want to throw 60 feet and you want to throw 180, you've got to spin. And that means you've got to watch every single technical analysis that I'm doing, <laughs> but you've also got to watch what are the great guys in the world doing and, and see what they're doing. And while you're watching it, engage with it. Try to feel what you're watching. Try to see what they're doing with their legs. Try to see what they're doing with their upper body and be a part of learning it. You can't, you can't just swipe, 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 swipe like. It's got to be you, – you've got to be a student. And, and there's so much content. There's so much information out there. There's, there's no excuse not to. Yeah. Um, and this kind of maybe a good connection of like athletes having to take some independence and, and ownership of their training – you do a lot of remote training with Throws University in this, especially in this COVID-19 crapshoot we're all in, right? Right. There's some tips or important elements for athletes when they are training on their own. How do they, you know, continue to make progress and in, in progress? I'll say this, you know, I, 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 our high school kids, you know, it's funny because I'm saying all this stuff, but, but I, we, I do tend to be – I do sometimes handhold my, my kids where not my own kids, my own kids, I don't do that with, but my own athletes, I'll be like, all right, this is a step-by-step -step process of what we're going to do today. But what has happened and, and Trevor's pointed this out is, is that our high school kids that we've seen during this craziness, like during this uh, tragedy that's going on have matured so much because they've, they've learned that question that I brought up earlier, why are you throwing? What is it in here that makes you throw? What makes you tick to go out to the circle when it's snowing and, and the shot's cold and you don't want to be out there and, and you don't want to lift, you know, you'd rather be inside. Right. And, and what makes you do that? And I think that what I would, would urge, you know, high school kids now is really like, why are you doing this? We're, if you're doing it, you're likely doing it because when the shot comes off your hand and you throw a bomb, it feels better than anything, right? It's, it's, it's uh, you know, John Callis, when he threw 20 meters, he called me up. He goes, if I could put this feeling into a pill, I'd be a billionaire. And that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing about throwing. That's what makes it so cool is that it's that emotional experience. And so these kids now are maturing quicker than they otherwise would have because they have to figure out do I really want to go out and throw five days a week, six days a week? Do I really want to lift four or five days a week? And they are, they're doing it. They're, they're pushing themselves. And now we're seven, eight weeks in and they're still doing it. And so I think, I think that's an interesting part is a lot of kids have matured quicker than they otherwise would have because they, they've learned how to train and push themselves individually without somebody over top of them, which is a very hard thing to learn in high school. Um, but as far as being at the circle, I, I always think it's it's best if you took like two or three throws and you and if you if you don't have a coach um, there or you don't you don't you're not getting a technical analysis or you're not following a script. I, I would recommend, hey, you go to practice with one or two technical focuses that that you want to have, and then you take you take your throws, you warm up, 
Maybe you take five or six easy throws. You start to establish how you're feeling, and then you take two or three videos. But you will, you take two or three throws, and you and you have it videoed, and then you can go back and you look at what happened those last three throws, and then you do that again. You batch it like two or three times, and then you just sit there. You say, all right, these last six throws, eight throws, I'm going ham. I'm gonna go as hard as I can, and I'm not, you know, maybe I'm I'm gonna have one technical cue, and I'm gonna try and improve from what I did, and then I gotta go lift, right? So I think that that's that's a beneficial way to sort of. And that's going to help those kids learn technique too, because they're going to start to see things and feel things and, and, and they're going to understand, they're going to have those epiphanies, like those technical epiphanies where you're like, Oh my God, why didn't I realize this two years ago? So I think that that's, I think that's also the best way to turn this current situation into a very big positive. We've got a kid, uh, Jeff Klein, dude, I feel terrible for him. He, he threw 64 feet indoors. Um, he would have, he would have mowed down the outdoor state title. Like he would have just destroyed it. Yeah. He probably would have thrown 67 feet. And now he's, he's not going to get to throw. And right now he's dropping bombs, but he's matured. He's like, he's matured drastically just because he's going out. I come to work at seven 30 in the morning. I get here at seven 30. I'm passing him at the high school throwing and then he's sending me videos and then he's, he's back out there again in the afternoon by himself. And it's like, Dude, you would have never done that two years ago, but that's 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 where it's like as 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 uh, coaches. It, it, for me, it's like I've got to try and foster that in 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 our athletes and and help them dig a little bit deeper because this time sucks. Yeah. It sucks for everybody. I think that's the other thing that 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 it's hard. I'm 36. I can put I can put perspective a little bit more perspective on life. Kids that are 16, 17, 18 years old. Dude, they don't have perspective. That's what sucks with the current situation. They don't know. They don't know life. They don't know what it's like, you know. And and then they're dealing with some some stuff that I didn't have to deal with. I had to deal with nine eleven, but that was that wasn't this. It was different, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Um, hopefully, we find ways to come out of it a little bit stronger. Yeah, I, I think we will. I think the throwing world will too. You see, you see Krauser's thrown on a sidewalk. It's like, dude, this guy's one of the best. He's an Olympic champ, Olympic record holder. If he can throw in hail on a sidewalk, anybody can. Yeah. <laughs> you got to send those videos to, the, uh, to your, uh, your kids that are training at every Right, day. right, right. Yeah, that's what I do. I'm like, and on top of that, he looked great. It's like, I think that might have been his, one of his best technical throws. <laughs> no toe board. Doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. It's like, man, he's yeah. an animal. Sweet. Yeah, I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, I think we'll, I got a couple of fun questions for you um, okay. regarding just like some of your elite experience. Do you have one or two moments that really stand out in your coaching career as just some like knockdown awesome moments? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Going to, you know, taking Sam through the call room at World Champs, that was, that was, dude, that was, I, I, it was unreal. Unreal. It's like you're standing there. It was like, Dude, that that's that's what motivates me. Dude, it it was just like holy shit. I'm I'm standing here right now. I'm standing next to Vestin. I'm standing next to Vice Heidinger, Stahl, uh, uh, Hadadi, everybody, and I'm like, and my guy can do some damage. He could do something here. Like this is unbelievable. Like this was, and then qualifying when he qualified too. Like that that was special. You know that was that was cool. Um, that for throwing that that was, yeah. You know, and and when in in coaching your first state champion, uh, that for me was very special as a coach. You know, um, a couple of it, when my first athlete made the world team in, in weightlifting, uh, that that's why I coach. Yeah. Very so, cool. Yeah, I, I have like 30, 30 of those. <laughs> uh, and Gary Aldrich Aldrich wanted to know. Uh, oh, Gary. Yeah, he, he's watching on YouTube. He sent me some awesome. questions beforehand. Uh, awesome, awesome. And he wants to know, how do you start working with Tim, Tim Nadal? Nadal? Nadal, yeah. Um, Timmy Cat, that's right. So, so actually, Tim, Tim was with me in 2017 at, at, at Worlds. Uh, it was me, Alex, Nick. My group was Al, uh, Alex Rose, Nick Arrhenius, and, um, and Tim. Uh, so, so basically, it's, it's, it's an interesting story is that 
Tim had been working with Vestin and um, I, some stuff happened in like 2016. Um, and he, he's, you know, he's about five hours North of here. He's in Canada. And he also trained under Dr. B. So I, I had known him a little bit. I didn't know him much, but I knew him a little bit. And so with Tim, um, I'm close. You know, I coach Nick Arrhenius and I, and I sort of coached Leif, his brother, and they're tight with Tim because of Vestin. They have a mutual connection, connection with Vestin because Nick throws for Sweden. And so um, we would have these group chats going, uh, text messages, and Tim would send me videos. And then he, he just hit me up. He's like, hey, can, can, would you be interested in coaching me? And I, and I was, yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, um, so we co I coached him for two years, and then Athletics Canada um, – they, 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 Athletics Canada wanted him to work with a Canadian coach, and now he doesn't really have one. But he's, dude, he's a good guy. He's a really good dude, and he, and he's, he's a beast, right? You know, he's a, he's a machine. <laughs> um, Sweet. Now, uh, I, I, I wanted to add one of the cooler experiences too was when yeah. Alex, Alex Rose qualified for, for Rio. And this, I just thought about this because when Alex threw sixty five indoors this year, that was cool. But when he Alex was my first athlete to qualify for the Olympics and that, you know, getting a, it, it sucks. I wasn't there, but I was there when he qualified for Tokyo. So that was cool. But the first time, you know, my son, my second son Sanderson had just been born and it was like the next day, dude, you know, he did it. And it's like, Holy crap. I, this kid threw 59 meters last year. Now he's on 65. This was awesome. That, that was, that was a, one of those, one of those real special moments, you know. Nice. Uh, I didn't want to leave Alex out. He would get mad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one last question, and then we'll, I know you could probably need to go get dinner and all that good stuff and, and spend some time with the kids, but um, Rob wants to know, where, when do you get your workouts in for the day? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Rob's saying that. He's still probably benching 405 over there for reps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um for you know, rob's rob's best deadlift he, he would take my max deadlift and do that for a set of 10 right now <laughs> rob had the world record in the deadlift at one point um that is true right rob i, I if i remember yeah long long time ago <laughs> <laughs> um yeah what for me so, so the way I set up the schedule with coaching is, is I, I, I have my uh, morning session weightlifters, which are the, the weightlifters that train twice a day. Um, and then I got the throwers come in and then, and then the weightlifters in the afternoon. And so when they, when they train at like 1030 in the morning, I go down and I try and set it up. So, so my, my, one of my best senior lifters, Jake Horse, he's a national champ, made, Pan Am champs. Uh, he's been a junior world team member. He's a stud. He's 67K. He also works for me. So he actually has his primary session only once a day. And, and I, I need to be there with him to coach him. But I also got to work out because if I don't work out, my head, I just lose my head. I can't handle stress at all. I can't handle it. And so when Jake trains at 1030 in the morning, I go down and I train with him. Um, and what's funny is lately he's been starting to squat close to what I can squat. So I'm like, I'm getting motivated to get my squat up because he's, he's only a 60, a 67 K lifter. So it's like, it, that's when I train. Now he also makes fun of me because I'll be coaching him with snatch technique and I'm doing bicep curls while he's snatching. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So that's when I do it. Awesome. Sometimes, sometimes if we're throwing inside because of snow, I'll, I'll run it on the ball bike. But I haven't been doing that, and I've gotten fatter since COVID hit. I, I've gained like 12 pounds. You're not the only one, man. You are not the only one. My wife's like, you haven't drank like this since Lincoln was a year old. And you drank before, and you're getting fatter. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> awesome. That might be a good way to end it right there. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, Dan, I appreciate you. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, 
And I want to th- thanks to MF for doing this and perform better. This is this is good stuff. I think this is what what the growing world needs stuff like this. And and this is where for me it throws university. I fail to do more things like this. So Rob, thank you. Thanks, perform better, MF for for what you guys do and for this. I think this is this is awesome. Thank you, Dan. This was great. This yeah. is tremendous. Thank you. Thanks again, Dane. Um, I do have one housekeeping thing. You know, uh, Dane said it better than I can. Thank you to MF and thank you to the National Girls Coach Association. MF has been uh, generous to gener- donate some, some gift cards uh, for people that are sharing and helping getting the word out on this on, on social media. And Ed Cosner, you're the winner of a $50 That's gift awesome. card this week. Um, so if you can get a hold of us, we will uh, get that out to you. Uh, I'll, I'll put my email and we can get you in contact with Rob um, as well. So again, big thanks to Rob, big thanks to Dane, big thanks to Tom earlier. Um, you know, we'll, we'll keep doing this. And, and if we can't coach, let's, let's learn a little bit while we're uh, cooped up. So uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll end the live stream and, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. Brandon, am I on? Can you want to yeah, tell them what we got next week? Oh yeah. We've uh, yeah. You want to, uh, you want to announce it, Rob? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So next week we're gonna do another uh, another double feature. Um, sorry, I was gonna see if I could bring up the. Uh, um, no, I don't have I don't have it up. Uh, we're gonna have Al Farishidian of Bates kick us off, and he's gonna talk about a queuing system he's been developing for the last couple of years. Al's awesome. He was my first boss and mentor, and, and the number of you know all American throwers he's had in, in division three NCA is pretty incredible and he's done a great job over the last couple of years excited to hear him at five and then we have Lance Deal coming on after him to talk a little bit of hammer and, and coaching and share some of his experiences so should be a, a pretty awesome uh, week to follow up uh, this week and, and keep this rolling so please share please tune in and uh, join us next week next Tuesday night thanks guys thanks a lot thanks yep.